All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Dataverse Community Meeting, the eighth annual Dataverse Community Meeting. I'm Sonia, and I wanted to welcome everyone this morning and hope that you guys enjoyed the plenary yesterday. Um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of today and tomorrow before we start. Uh, today, we'll be beginning with the GDCC governance session two. Uh, that'll be followed by a brief discussion um, or presentation for Force 11 and COPE Data Publishing Ethics Working Group and an introduction to the Dataverse um, software. At 10 a.m., we will start concurrent sessions um, on tools, curation, metadata, curation, and workflows, followed by a break, a brief break. We will discuss the Harvard Data Commons Dash uh, Digital Access to Scholarship at Harvard um, and Dataverse integration. And later in the afternoon, we'll be covering the metadata session, preservation session, and geospatial session. Um, these, uh, all of these sessions um, are uh, duplicated tomorrow, by the way. So um, there's session two, most of them are the same. The geospatial session today has two additional speakers that will not be presenting tomorrow, uh, but for the most part, the sessions are duplicates. So this morning, we are going to welcome Jonathan Crabtree, Philip Consett, and James Myers. Jonathan Crabtree is the Assistant Director for Research Data Information Systems at the Odom Institute for Research and Social Science at UNC Chapel Hill, and he helps to lead the Global Dataverse Community Consortium, the GDCC. The Institute's Social Science Data Archive is one of the oldest and most extensive in the United States. As Director, John is completely revamped the Institute's technology infrastructure and has positioned the Institute to assume a leading national role in information archiving. He is president of the International Federation of Data Organizations and leads a development group supporting the use of Dataverse for data publication and verification workflows on journals. Philip Konzit is a senior research librarian responsible for Nordic and Finnish Kevin Linguistics and Literature at the University Library, UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. As a member of the library's research support team, he devotes much of his time to working on open science, especially research data management. He is part of the repository management of Dataverse NO and of the Tromso Repository of Language and Linguistics. He is a part of the steering committee of the Global Dataverse Community Consortium and has been a member of several working groups and managing committees related to research data management and open science, including the European Research Infrastructure for Language Resource and Technology, the European Cooperation in Science and Technology, um, LIBER and the Association, and RDA in Norway and the RDA Linguistics Data IG. James is a scientific software research developer and a member of the GDCC and QDR. Welcome. Yeah. John, can you get us started? Absolutely. So good morning. Hope everyone's having a, a great uh, beginning of the second day here and enjoy the first day of the conference, as uh, Sonia had mentioned. Uh, lots of exciting things going on. Uh, just to remind everybody about the Zoom etiquette. We're all we're all used to Zoom these days, so I don't think we need to elaborate on this. It seems like we're uh, constantly on Zoom, and and hopefully next year we'll be in person and we'll be able to uh, see each other and and maybe even have a a uh, little bit of football. I hope next year. So next slide. Welcome. Uh, this is a, a quick outline of what we're talking about, uh, and it'll be uh, we'll do a quick quick introduction. And Philip will help go through the governance, and then we'll do a membership update and, and finances, and then we'll do a, uh, a overview of all the great services that GDCC has been doing and the and the work we've been doing to uh, work with the community uh, and build this community we call the the GDCC. The next slide. Uh, the main thing that uh, I wanted to, uh, to mention is that uh, to reiterate what Gary had talked about yesterday is that uh, this is a very giving community. Everyone is uh, volunteering their time here on the, on the board and as well as uh, doing work for uh, uh, code and editing things. And there's lots and lots of contributions to build 
uh, Dataverse to where it is today. Go, looking back over the years from where we came from and where we are now and where we're going to go to, it's just amazing that this community is really a, a, a generous community. Uh, and you'll see from uh, some of the slides that uh, Jim talks about uh, just how much contribution this community has made to uh, research data management and the Dataverse software. So with that, I'll let um, uh, Philip get started and, and give us a little bit of history. Yeah, thanks, John. So uh, John already has mentioned you know, the, the most important thing about the, the community, about the community uh, bottom-up effort. Um, just a brief history and, and recap about GDCC. It was introduced in, in 2018 at the community meeting. Uh, where John and, and Mercy, Mercy Crosses, shared some initial ideas about uh, the, the governance of GDCC uh, or a possible governance structure and, and also about, about potential services and, and expert groups that could be coordinated by, by the consortium. Um, there was also um, created a, a vision statement for, for GDCC and there were some initial discussions about it, but uh, ever since then it has kind of been been unchanged since uh, uh, 2018. So here you see the, the, the statement. Uh, some of you already participated yesterday probably and have heard about different efforts within the community. And uh, a lot of members are already already contributing to, to, to Dataverse with code, external tools and, 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 and other efforts. And you will be hearing more about, about these efforts today and, and tomorrow. Um, so GDCC is, is really here to, to help coordinate all these efforts and together with Harvard help community members to uh, community members collaborate on, on Dataverse related issue, issues. So it's about helping you to, uh, to achieve your goals while at the same time staying with a kind of unified goals within the community uh, so that we don't get kind of try to to uh, unify a kind of target a, a, a unified goal within the community so that it's not a kind of many forks that are not sustainable in the in the long run so gdcc is really about providing international organization organization to ex existing community efforts and it's also about helping build strong partnership partnership about about among the members and we also want the gdcc to be an inclusive organization so uh, we're welcoming membership from, from any kinds of organiza organizations using uh, Dataverse or, or just be in, interested in, in Dataverse. Um, yeah. Um, so when GDCC was introduced um, in, in back in, in 2018, we had a, a we had some break, breakout discussions in, in four groups, and they resulted in, in really valuable feedback and also great ideas about the further development of GDCC. And some of these ideas we have been uh, following up on. Uh, for instance, we, we we are already coordinating community efforts through interest groups and working groups and and, and pull requests on on GitHub. Uh, and also other resources provided through through the GDCC GitHub repositories. And uh, we are also supporting the community on, on technical and organizational issues uh, through through the GDCC consulting consulting services, and also through support we provide on uh, in discussion groups uh, on Slack and other communication channels. And GDCC also provides DOIs to to some of its members through this uh, consortium membership we have in, in uh, with Datasite. And we have also been organizing some community events outside Harvard and North America. For instance, in 2020, we had this first European Dataverse uh, workshop here in my place in, in, in Norway. And, uh, and John and Jim will provide more details about some of the activities we have been doing uh, during the past year. Yeah. So, um, uh, but then on the other hand, there are still some kind of more overarching aspects of the GDCC, uh, which, which there is still some work to be done, uh, for instance, on, on governance structure and also on, on the sustainability of, of, of the GDCC. But we have also been working on, on these topics for also in the last uh, past year. Uh, and uh, so I, I thought it could be worthwhile to spend some time talking about sustainability and, and governments, governance. 
Um, so as you probably have seen on or those of you that follow our Slack uh, area in, in about Dataverse and GDCC have probably seen the, the chart that uh, Phil, Phil Durbin from IQSS posted there last week. It's about the, the, the development of the number of installations around the globe. And it's, as you see, it has been continuously increasing, continuously growing. Um, and just to remind you, the numbers you see here on, on this graph is, is only about, it reflects only the installations that have been reported to, to Harvard or GDCC and that are part of our kind of more official metrics. And, and apart from this, we also know that there are, are in addition a number of existing installations that are not yet part of this uh, kind of official overview. So for example, just um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the conference in, in Oslo and there I, I learned that uh, the, the um, Icelandic social science data service also uses Dataverse, uh, the Dataverse software as their repository platform, but it's not yet included in, in our shared spreadsheet. Um, we also know of several national Dataverse based repositories being developed, for instance, in, in Denmark, France and, and Hungary in Europe. Uh, and also of existing national and regional database consortia that are attracting uh, more and more partner institutions. And uh, one of the consequences of this popularity of the database application is of course that there is an increasing need for, for uh, improving uh, ex existing functionality and also adding new features to the software, as well as integrating the, the, the database platform with other tools and services. And we may illustrate this with a number with a number of issues on, on um, in the GitHub repository of the main distribution of the data software. So as you see here on, on the right hand side, there are currently more than uh, two, 1,200 open issues uh, in in these repositories, and some of them uh, are about bugs, but many of them are also about feature ideas and and feature requests. Uh, so this this continuous growth, of course, of the database community is, is a very positive thing because it just um, illustrates the, that there is a real need for for dataverse uh, around the world. But it also comes the growth also comes with some challenges. So that's why we have um, identified a, a need for strengthening the sustainable development of the of the dataverse software and also uh, the, the the ecosystem of associated uh, tools and services. And we also see GDCC playing an important role in this work. And, and therefore we have been having some discussions on, on how we can further empower the GDCC to, to contribute to the Dataverse community with, with support and services uh, we need. And as a first step in this work, we agreed to, to uh, run a survey uh, about, uh, to, to, to survey the, the roadmaps and priorities of the, the different Dataverse installations around the world. Um, and this is the reason why we designed the community survey, which was sent, sent to existing and also some aspiring Dataverse installations in, in the beginning of, of May. And we, the, we got the last submissions only um, less than a, a week ago, so we haven't really had the time to, to analyze uh, the, the results in detail, but as promised in the survey, we will now give some or have a look at a few initial results from the survey. Um, yeah. So um, there were um, we got uh, 34 coordinated response responses from from installations, uh, and I'll briefly show some of the results from the last part of the the survey, which is about sustainability and governance. Uh, and the goal of this the last part is is to figure out of figure out how important different resources are to ensure the sustainable development and maintenance of the data software and the, the ecosystem of uh, associated services and tools. Uh, yeah, and as, as you see it on, at, at, on, um, on the bottom here, uh, all, all these, um, the, the raw data from, from the survey will be published uh, openly. Yeah, so in the question 40, we, we asked, uh, question 40 is about how important Dataverse installation consider uh, different existing and potential sources uh, to ensure the sustainability of the date of Dataverse, the Dataverse software and also the, the associated services and tools. And there are there were uh, uh, a number of answer alternatives, 
including not applicable, not important, somewhat important, neither nor important, very important. Um, and to, to simplify things a little, when visualizing the, the results, I have merged the, the, the last two alternatives that is important and very important. Uh, so to get a kind of overview of the distribution in percentage, per, percentages, percentages for the different sources, as you can see on, 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 on in this graph here. So as you see here, most respondents consider the commitment by Harvard and also the commitment channeled through the GDCC to be important or very important for ensuring sustainability of the software. Then we had another question. Uh, uh, about uh, governance, uh, which was about how important the different installations consider different types of governance support uh, to ensure sustainability. Um, and as you see here, um, uh, uh, governance support from both GDCC and Harvard is, is considered uh, to be important or very important. And you also see here that actually most reports, most respondents consider GDCC as a non-profit organization to be the most important type of governance support to ensure sustainability. Then there was a, another question about um, uh, which is narrowing down to, to GDCC and asks about how important it is for database installation that the GDCC provides or should provide different types of governance support to ensure sustainability. Uh, and as you can see here, several of the listed uh, types of activities were considered to be important by, by a vast majority of the uh, respondents. And at the top, you, you have um, the coordination of community efforts and also sustaining the software and associated services and tools. And you can also see from this uh, um, overview here that uh, uh, maybe apart from the, the activity mentioned in, in alternative B, which is about coordinating grant applications, uh, GDCC already provides these types of governance supports, uh, support uh, today in, in one form or another. Uh, so let me come back now to the initial issue, which was uh, the need for strengthening the sustainable development of, of the data software and, and associated tools and services. So um, the idea is to, to use the, the results from this uh, community survey as a, as a starting point for a more structured, uh, for more structured discussions about the needs and ambitions of the different data data installations and that this kind of discussion could then uh, result uh, uh, into a proposed uh, proposal of a shared vision and roadmap for the for the entire global data community. And our plan is to get this, uh, these dis discussions started after the summer. And we think that it is this, this, this kind of a more uh, shared approach will, be, uh, will benefit uh, the, the community at large. And it's also about limiting, could also help us limit, limit divergence across installations and, and community efforts, because this is very important for, for the continuous success of the data project and the community. So it's really about uh, uh, trying not to uh, have too much divergence into, for instance, different forks, which the different uh, installations have, but rather uh, try to to uh, to pull this back into kind of unified uh, effort, which benefits the whole community. Uh, a few words about the governance of GDCC. Um, um, as John said at the community community meeting last year, we we work along a three tier strategy. For, for the GDCC governance structure. And we started off with a kind of lightweight organization structure. So currently the only up and running body is still the, the steering uh, committee, which is uh, here to uh, to do the kind of day day on and day out work and which currently, currently exists of, of John from Odum at UNC, Steve from the Australian uh, Data um, Archive. Len from uh, IQSS at Harvard and myself from UIT. And our task is kind of help shape the next step, steps of the, the, the GDCC along with other members of the community. And, and to do that, we want as much input from the community as, as we can and, and also during this session here. So um, please keep adding um, um, comments to, to the shared Google notes doc that Sonia shared in the, in the chat. Um, then we have uh, two committees that are still under development. 
Uh, there is, first, there is the General Advisory Committee, which will consist of external people from organizations like CoData, ODA, and, or, or, or other repositories and other data organiza organizations. And as mentioned at the last community meeting, Mercy Crosas also had agreed to um, uh, be part of this group. And then we have a, a, a more technical advisory committee, which is which right now consists of uh, Jim and uh, Gustavo Durand from IQSS. But also here in this group, the idea is to put more and more people uh, onto onto the group, and and also including external people. Um, then there have been there has been some uh, um, governance changes. A couple of weeks ago, we had a meeting where we decided to to do some internal changes. So I will be serving as the chair and uh, John will be serving as the treasurer until the next community meeting uh, uh, next year. Uh, and our plan is to, to, to formalize the steering committee. Uh, um, so we'll be reaching out for you and uh, for volunteers for being nominating to the steering committee. And we are also planning to, to have elections uh, at the next community meeting, uh, which hopefully hopefully will be a physical meeting again in, in, in June at, at, at Harvard. Um, so we're really looking forward to more and more community participation also in, in the GDC governance. We have seen that the, this approach of including people uh, in, in interest groups and, and working groups is really been um, uh, successful and there are still um, be, uh, such groups being established, and, and, and Jim will talk more about, uh, about this later, later in the session. Um, we are also investigating uh, the organizational status of GDCC, as indicated in the community survey, and as you saw on, the, on, on one of the slides, um, uh, we're talking about the transition to a formal non-profit organization could be a possible way to, to kind of formalize also and empower GDCC. Um, so this could be a, 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 an organization of a 501c3 in the US uh, or a, a nonprofit uh, organization in, in Europe or even both in, in both uh, areas. And also in this work, we will need uh, help and advice, advice from you. Um, John also has mentioned in earlier meetings that the, the, the commitment of, of ODUM and, and UNC for the budget and finance part of the GDCC was kind of meant for an incubation period. Uh, but now we think it's really time to, to move this on into a, a governance structure that not only manages the, the finances, but also manages the direction we take uh, uh, takeovers in. So to summarize, as you can see, the, the organization and the role of GDCC is still, in, is still being shaped and it really needs a, a much dedicated commitment from, from, from the whole community. So we, we, we'd love to hear your feedback uh, on this, on our ideas and plans and what we presented, uh, what I presented right now and, and John and Jim will be presenting. Uh, so either add your comments and questions in, in the Google Docs or just uh, uh, ask them uh, and speak up and in, in the um, Q&A and discussion uh, session, uh, part of the, this session. Yeah, John, over to you. Yes, thanks so much. So uh, I want to transition a little bit over to the critical part of the, the GDCC, and that's the community. Uh, and, you know, we have a, a great group of folks and you'll, you'll hear a little more about the work that everyone's doing, but our member uh, list uh, on the next slide, the, the member list shows that we're uh, covering uh, 34 members across 17 countries, which is pretty amazing. We are truly international. Uh, we're also seeing uh, that within, within countries, some of these uh, some data verses are starting to organize uh, and have, uh, you know, it's, it's, of course it started at Don's years ago, but now uh, the, the, the folks in Canada and the folks in Brazil are now working on this, but lots of uh, countries are starting to create national infrastructures around data verse or networks of data verse. So uh, we're so excited to, to have all these uh, folks as members and to be contributing mem members. That's the, the real important part here is that not only do these members uh, receive services from GDCC, they also uh, contribute back 
uh, just as Gary was talking about yesterday about uh, we're a very giving community. So next slide. So it's been a very, very busy budget year. Uh, we've had lots of contracts. We've had lots of uh, effort. Um, things are, are looking pretty good uh, as far as the, the budget goes. Uh, we've actually uh, at, at several points had as much work as we could do. Uh, so we were uh, very, very close to having to look for other resources <laughs> to get some of these things done. So we're, we're, we're doing fairly well. As you can see, um, uh, income and expenses in, are in excess of $175,000 uh, each this year. Now, uh, the uh, income does include some accounts receivables. Some of these are, are memberships and data site fees, and some of them are contracts. Often there, there are some things that are, have just been billed too. So uh, some of these are not very far in arrears, but if you include all the accounts receivables at this point, uh, we're running a, a, a slight um, uh, positive account. So things are looking fairly good. And this is a physical year from July 21 to, July, uh, to June 22. Uh, there is some little bit of a uh, estimations here because the data site fees are actually an annual fee, uh, and we were in our physical year, uh, both at UNC and for the community meetings run in, on the physical year. So there's a little bit of differences there, but uh, not a whole lot. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have some unpaid memberships. Uh, and uh, we build uh, $17,000 in memberships, and we've had about a little over 10,000 uh, paid. Um, uh, as you notice, the list below are the ones that, that we're still waiting. But as you notice, there's several stars by lots of these, and these are in process. Uh, as we all know, getting things through the system at, at many uh, public universities and governments is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, in addition, if you're listed here and you think you've paid, please let me know uh, because uh, we are having challenges, even identifying payments, especially wire transfers from overseas. Uh, the, unfortunately, they seem to get uh, routed into a holding bin. Uh, and before we claim them at GDCC, sometimes they sit for weeks or months. Um, as Philip mentioned, it will be nice and eventually to get us into a nonprofit uh, where we have a little bit better control of the finances. Uh, because right now we rely on, on UNC Chapel Hill and their workflows, and it is a big organization, so sometimes these smaller things get, uh, get uh, hard to find and hard to track. So next slide. The data site uh, uh, DOIs were our very first uh, service uh, out of necessity because many folks needed a, a, a better way to provide those to their members. Uh, so we have billed around uh, around twenty nine thousand five hundred forty dollars to members for this service, uh, and twenty two thousand seven hundred has been paid. Uh, we still uh, have some accounts receivables in excess of six thousand dollars, but again, we're working on some of those as well. Uh, and if uh, your name is listed here and uh, and you think you've already paid, please let me know. Uh, but we do have some of these in process, and we we're trying to get in contact. With, with these folks to get these things. So currently we're running a slight negative balance, but if everyone pays, this service will in, end up uh, being the, in, in the black as well. So next page. Um, this uh, proposed fee change really should have happened this past year. Uh, we actually talked about it last year. I did not get it enacted uh, due to some issues uh, with the paperwork, but I'm hoping to get this uh, push through uh, this year. It'll be due January 1 of 2023. Uh, and this will uh, eliminate the need for wire transfer credit cards. Uh, in the past, you, people had to add that on top and it was so hard for everyone to do that. Uh, and this extra money will keep us from uh, losing money in the, in the uh, bank transfer fees. So next. Uh, as far as the, the DOI fees or DOI fees, uh, things will not change uh, come next year. Uh, the latest con conversations with DataSite uh, say they're gonna stay the same. So this is the exact same fee as this year. Uh, and they do already include all the bank fees and, uh, and uh, transfer fees. Uh, so that'll help us 
uh, eliminate that deficit that we had last year as well. Next slide. I uh, want to turn it over to Jim now to talk about uh, all the work that, that has happened to generate uh, these incomes uh, and all the great work that uh, the community has done to contribute to Dataverse and to make the GDCC what it is and make Dataverse what it is actually. So Jim. Right. Thanks, John. Um, go, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so at, at Philip was saying earlier in the in the survey that uh, um, you know, looking at the things that the community wanted from GDCC and that in some form or other, we were doing lots of things. So in, in, at some level, this section is here are the forms um, that we're actually doing those things in. Um, and as one other uh, preface to, to digging into these things, um, you know, like th this is a, a very vibrant community. And so it, it really is hard to split out anything and say, well, Harvard does this, GDCC does that, and the community does this. A lot of this you know, when a poll request goes in, it was because of discussion in the community. GDCC might be in the middle, but Harvard is doing some of the, you know, the testing and merging on the other end. So it, it's really hard to, to completely break things apart. Um, with, with that kind of um, caveat, though, I want to give you this set of uh, things that are going on, um, both, you know, sort of from two or three different directions here. One, um, you know, you can see what GDCC is doing. Um, uh, so things you can get involved in, things you can take advantage of, um, things where you can contribute back to the community, things that you might want to do for your own institutions that GDCC can help with and so on. Um, so th there are a wide range of things and I'm kind of going from some of the more in informal sort of things happen on a daily basis to things that are more, uh, you know, contract based and trying to get GDCC involved in something specific for, for your institution. Um, the things that are going on kind of all the time is that, uh, you know, it's, it's the community is trying to develop things. Uh, Dataverse is a pretty rich piece of software um, with lots of functionality in it. And if you just want to add one little piece, it's often hard to figure out where, where do you dig inside to do the one thing, you know, make the one change you want. Uh, Design-wise, how do you do that and not break lots of other functionality? Um, how do we take advantage of when somebody wants to, to add something, can we refactor and make it a little bit cleaner to, to uh, make it easier to make changes in the future? Um, so we're trying to help, you know, again, along with Harvard to try and get in, in there and help people be effective when they're doing their own developments, um, make sure that things that are, that are coming in are, are helping to, uh, uh, you know, improve the software and make it more modular, make it easier to use as we go forward. Um, a lot of these kind of get to the level of uh, uh, we've mentioned with um, uh, Don's in particular this last year, the embargo and multi-license functionalities were things that um, were requests from Don's uh, involved some of their programming, involved me um, being in the programming. But before we started any of those um, embargo in particular, there are lots of ways we could think about doing it. So one of the things that we led from the GDCC side was to come up with a Google document that says, here are the requirements that various people have said they want to get out of embargoes. Here are various designs we could do it that have some good, good points and bad points. And we had a series of discussions and coordination around that document to essentially pick one design. Finally, this is what got implemented and, and what is now available in there. Um, and that, that is, if you haven't looked at it, that's essentially uh, allowing you to select individual files or sets of files and do embargoes on those. So you can have multiple, um, multiple embargo timescales with, even within a, a single data set. Um, we also, you know, again, uh, lots of things come in uh, uh, as a, as a one-off uh, contribution from external project, but you know, when, when the rest of the software changes, there, there are changes that are needed to keep that up to date in the new version. So GDCC is involved in trying to, you know, do those updates, um, fix some of those minor issues and so on. Um, and, you know, some of this is, is, is sort of work in the programming side. Some of this is just responding to emails and Slack messages. And I've talked mostly around development. The last bullet here is to point out that, you know, this is not just about development. It's about when you're when you're doing a new install, when you're trying to uh, turn on some of the new features that have appeared in the, the later versions, when you when you uh, uh, migrate up to the latest, um, different ways you can manage your, your installations and so on. 
uh, DDCC is, is contributing to the conversation there as well. And again, lots of community members will, will help you out if you, if you reach out on the email message on the email list as well. Okay, next slide. Um, sort of more broader community um, coordination efforts. We've got community meetings that have, that have been talked about a few times. Um, they're every couple of weeks. Um, both GDCC and Harvard kind of give you the, the latest on what's happening in Dataverse, what new things are coming along. Um, we'll, we'll highlight when there are security issues or when upgrading to the next release. You know, you, you got to remember to upload, update the database or some other piece of software. We'll try and, uh, you know, th those are in the release notes, but we give you some reminders in the community meetings, um, lots of questions, and we try to answer questions that come up in those and so on. Um, there are lots of uh, repositories here. Dataverse is, is, we talk about it as a piece of software, but we actually have previewers and the um, uh, languages uh, for internationalization, things like the DV uploader Ansible for doing installs, PyDataverse for interacting with the API, external vocabularies. All of those things are essentially separate pieces of software. Um, some of them started out in other places, but GDCC is kind of managing a set of GitHub repositories where those all sit now. Um, so they've got some GDCC branding, but we're helping to make sure that people can get in and add contributors and do the, the management of those repositories. Some of those were contributing to the software, others it's mostly the community contributing and we're just trying to you know, give a place and make sure that, that we're keeping uh, uh, the repositories up. Um, similarly, uh, there's a lot of build infrastructure um, when we need a new development machine or S3 bucket or other things to either develop or test or show things off to the community, GDCC is helping to provide a lot of that. Um, Philip was mentioning earlier working groups. We've, we've got, um, you know, sort of the email and Slack and things, but we started at the last meeting, we talked about a, having a metadata working group. Um, which very quickly turned into, I think on, on Slack, now there's about a dozen different channels um, from, from DevOps to geospatial to big data to working with PyDataverse and so on. Um, so we, we, we basically have uh, set up uh, Slack. We have channels for people with interest groups. Um, there are documents behind some of those and, and uh, you know websites, uh, even for some of them, I think. Um, in terms of meetings, we set up uh, a series of metadata working group meetings. Um, and again, sort of we, as people volunteered topics they wanted to bring up to discuss an idea, uh, you know, design possibility, we'd have those meetings and we'd, we'd swap that out for various topics. Um, we haven't had any in the, in the recent past, um, but that's still something that when, when we need a community discussion, we kind of have a, a standing time that we can go drop meetings into and, and have a discussion around that. Okay, next slide. Um, the, the next two are kind of getting into things where, um, you know, one, one of the challenges of coming into a, a community when you have a, 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 you know, big rich piece of software and lots of choices to make and so on is, is getting up to speed quickly. Um, you know, if you do that on your own, these are all things where, um, you, you know, it could be very intense for a little while, but it's not a full time, you know, it's not not a full person um, that you need to hire staff on for necessarily to do things. And so you kind of get stuck if you can't find somebody else who can do it. And if you have to train somebody, the project is five or 10 times bigger than if you could just get somebody who's done it, you know, a whole bunch of times before. So um, starting with things on the installation training uh, side, uh, uh, GDCC is involved in various projects, and you can see some listed here. A lot of this is uh, uh, Don Sizemore helping you know people get uh, up to the latest versions, uh, turn on the features that they want to have, um, working through how to how to manage and, and do that. So Texas, um, you know, we've had a project to bring them up to the the latest 510. Um, plus um, Italy, um, and then John Hopkins is another one starting this year. There have been other ones in the past, but basically there's, you know, if, if you're looking to upgrade, if you're looking to turn on new features that you haven't done before and you just want some help walking through, these are things that GDCC can help you with, you know, from, from a few hours to a week or something. Um, next one. Um, same thing on the programming side. Um, we've done a lot of those. Um, and again, the uh, this can be anything from with uh, Sciences Po, um, you know, as a multilingual dataverse. And so we, we have internationalization in dataverse, but it wasn't all the way through to all of the DDI and other exports. Um, 
you couldn't indicate which language you were adding metadata in. And so we've added a bunch of features over the last few versions for, for them um, that again, they're in the version, they're, they're useful and usable by everyone now, but they were, they were supported uh, by Sciences Po. Um, Don's I've mentioned embargo and multi-license. Another thing that's kind of slid in with, with Don's there is because they're migrating from another system, uh, we did a lot of work to get some of the workflows and um, being able to migrate data sets in and keep the original DOI, keep the original publication dates on when you when you use those migrate APIs. And so um, that, that all, again, is now in Dataverse because of Don support. Um, uh, TDL in Texas um, has been using the, the bag archiving and as uh, I'll, I'll talk about in other talks during the meeting, um, they've helped put in a, a batch API call that allows you to, uh, if, you, if you want, rather than triggering um, archiving every time somebody publishes, if you want to save up and do a new set of archiving every few months, there's now a batch call for that. In setting that up when we wanted to do lots of things high speed, um, that helped to figure out a lot of timeout load performance kind of issues in, in the batch in the bag archiving that we do. So um, Texas has helped support a lot of improvements in the robustness around that. Um, Harvard Data Commons is another one that, that again has multiple parts. There's a talk at, at noon or so or 12:15 about the overall Harvard Data Commons, but you'll see pieces of that in many talks. Um, that is doing anything from large data support with Globus uh, and remote storage, where we're, we're actually in those cases picking up things from other community members and kind of pushing them over the finish line with, with Harvard support from their data commons project. Uh, there's workflow and software additions that are talked about in other areas. Um, there's improvements to archiving there as well. Um, things like support for archiving desk three now, if you, if you, you know, go, go to the other talk here more, but um, that's a highlight there. Um, and even uh, interaction between uh, Dataverse and other applications so that you can trigger updates and, and sort of inform one, inform software when Dataverse has a connection between, for example, your data set and a paper somewhere else, you can go tell the paper archive that it might wanna make the backlink. Um, so lots of interesting stuff. And again, it, it's basically things where um, be, because a lot of these things were community contributions, GDCC is kind of in the middle trying to get what Harvard needs based on what's already there and kind of bring it together and get it into the package. Um, and, and again, there, there's more you've, you've heard uh, Harvard talk about their NIH grants, some of those things. So again, we'll, we'll probably involve GDCC in the middle. Okay, um, next slide. Um, so again, just to want to kind of quantify this a little bit and, and again lots of caveats here as well along with you can't tell exactly who's doing what because it's it really is a community effort and multiple players involved um, trying to measure software is also um, very fraught you know a pull request can be big or small um, commits which are the things underneath the hood are you know what, what somebody decided was worth saving and that could be you know one letter change to fix a typo or it could be changes to 12 or 15 classes that all represent one one step forward um, that said when when you know there, there are lots of uh, software systems that say they're open source and when you go look at them uh, they're open source but all the development is done by the original team that's still on the original grant and if there are any other contributors it's really people who are on some shared grant and there there really isn't a there is really isn't a broad base of developers who are from independent places with independent funding who understand a lot about the software and part of what i want to give you a sense here with the, the things on this slide is that dataverse has, has gone you know very far beyond that so um in, in the first bullet there again there, there are major features that have basically come in from outside of Harvard um, that, have, that have involved multiple community members programming in the community, programming with D GDCC, um, design discussions across the community. Um, there are sort of ongoing areas of focus, things like internationalization where multiple people are contributing. Um, accessibility is another one. Um, there, there are contributions there from QDR, from uh, Scholars Portal, now Borealis. Um, you know, have made continuing contributions over time in, in those areas. And then they're just, you know, one shot bug fixes and updates. People find a bug, um, it gets fixed. Um, people, you know, have an issue. People want a small feature, um, you know, kind of turn around those quickly. Um, so in terms of pull requests and code contributions, and again, I, I was just looking here 
kind of looking for rough rough statistics and rough counts, I didn't go look through the previewers and metrics and Ansible and all the other GDCC repositories and things. I just looked in the main repository. And over the last year, um, you know, by, by my count, I would say about 30% of the completed pull requests involved either GDCC directly or the community. Um, I think a lot of those, again, were, were the big ones like embargoes and multi-license. So the count was down, but the, the content was big. Next year, um, I think of the open PRs, about 50% of the active ones are, are from the from GDCC or the community. And if you look at the lower level, again, which kind of gets a little bit more to the contribution size, I think over 50% of the, the commits in the last year have been from either GDCC or the community members. So there's a lot of activity outside of Harvard. There's still a lot of activity at Harvard, but it's all working together. And, and you can see it's a very broad base of, of activity there. Um, the last thing I just wanted to give a shout out kind of to, on the security side, um, Don Sizemore is, is our canary in the coal mine. Uh, in a lot of cases, he's really keeping his, his uh, you know, nose and, and kind of watching out there um, to make sure that uh, uh, we're, we're hearing about security issues and getting the, them resolved. Um, but both Don and the community, um, you know, there's a lot of um, security testing at various installations and those issues and the reports are getting back to to Harvard and GDCC and and we're you know actively taking advantage of the fact that people are identifying these so that we can go resolve them and get them back out into the into the um, releases that we all use um, and in particular if you you know if you've been around watching security at all the log 4j issue last year um, the, the the nice thing there is that that actually hit kind of around the holiday and I think if you had if you had tried to get you know any single institution, you probably wouldn't have gotten enough people with enough knowledge to figure that out. But because we were basically in Slack and pinging around the globe and getting multiple people involved, we quickly figured out what the problem was in terms of, of what what were the vulnerabilities in Dataverse, and we got the notice out to the community and we got things uh, uh, fixed so that we didn't fall uh, victim to that at least on you know on the latest versions and and the recent versions where you could make some. Uh, uh, you could do some workarounds to stop the vulnerability. Okay, um, go ahead. Last slide. So with that, I'll, I'll stop the the overview of what's going on. Um, if you want more information, again, you know we're we're all very visible and and lots of ways to get in touch with us. There's the website you can go to with more information about how to how to join GCCC, um, how to get involved in uh, uh, getting your DOIs through the the GDCC data site consortium. Um, list of services out there, John's email address and other things are out there. Um, if you want to get on, uh, you know, the, the emails and slacks, so that information is around both at, at uh, the global site and the, uh, the Dataverse sites themselves. Um, so you can get on the community mailing list. Um, you can get on Slack. Um, the, the one trick with Slack, I don't know where we want to post it, is that uh, because we're using the free version of Slack for the community, uh, we've run out of the ability to invite people one by one. So we have to send you the invite link and you go sign up yourself. Um, and we're trying not to post that on a public website because that means anybody who can find that link can then go and get invited in. So if you want to just, uh, uh, you know, send an email, um, uh, you know, contact the person you know in Dataverse and we'll get you the invite link. Um, and if there's a place that we can we can post it for the meeting that doesn't uh, then show up on the website at the end. We'll try and do that as well. I think that's it. Thanks. Yeah, I think we are open for, for discussion, questions and comments. Um, I couldn't see any in the chat. I, I have one to start us off. I was just curious, um, John, as you were going through the, the data site um, uh, fees, I was curious, have, do you have any sense of how much people are saving by having that consortium arrangement? Yeah, uh, a, a little bit of a sense. I can't give you exact numbers because I don't, yeah. I don't, not looking at them right now. But uh, basically, the the largest savings is the membership. Uh, the data site, if you to get data site, uh, in order to pay for DOIs before you ever pay for the DOI, you have to join their consortium. 
and that is uh, 2,000 euros. And with, uh, with joining GDCC, we pay that 2,000 euros up front. Uh, so you don't have to do that. So if you were to go directly there, it's 2,000 euros per year plus whatever your DOI fee is, and that, that can vary. But uh, most of the time, uh, that is between uh, almost another 1,000 euros, 800 to 1,000 euros uh, at the most. So together, that's around 3,000 euros uh, for the minimum amount. And uh, as you saw from our, our fee schedule, we're about, uh, you know, dollars about 11 or 1,200. So, so 14 or 1,500 uh, for the total package. So the savings are at least uh, five or $600 for the, for the smaller institutions. The larger ones, uh, it may even be more than that for those. So it's the main, the main thing is everyone doesn't have to join uh, the, the consortium. I, we only join once and then we don't have to pay that for everybody. Any other questions or comments? Ideas? I don't know. Oh, I can't, I can't see it. Yeah, Phil for has some reason. Uh, Sorry. Go, Phil. go right ahead, Phil. Ah, uh, OK. So Dwayne, can you um, can you um, make it? Uh, uh, Sonia has to do it. Hey, oh, no, okay. I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, I can join as a panelist. No, don't do that. <laughs> you can go ahead. Okay, I'm a panelist. If I turn on my video, you can even see me. Hey, um, yeah. So I had a question um, about the GDCC. And I don't know if Stefan is, is on the call or not, but yesterday he said that uh, he's leaving his institute, which has helped support him in being the um, creator and maintainer of Pi Dataverse. And I guess I'm just wondering, um, is there any way we can fund him somehow? I, th I think he's interested in like part-time funding, like not like a full-time job, but like, can we, throw some money his way so that he can keep maintaining Pi Dataverse? Or is GDCC like the right um, organization for that sort of uh, model? We, we, we've actually talked with him oh, uh, about okay. that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, John, John was mentioning a little bit earlier, right, that, that there are times where the, 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 the people we have, right, which a lot of that is, is me and Don at this point, um, you know, isn't necessarily adequate, or we're not the, the right experts. And so we, we've actually done some reach out, even through the community meetings, and had some discussions about, you know, are there other people in the community who could pick up? Uh, and again, right, the, there's sort of this distinction between the, um, you know, can you can you contribute just because you're a community member and we'd like to get your code in, versus you know somebody else in the community actually has funding and would like to support some specific development and could you even do it and so I, I think both of those models are kind of on the table and and again we, we've talked with Stefano about this in particular with PyDataverse that since it's widely used you know if there are people who can help support that get, getting it to Stefano he's probably the right person to, to do a lot of those so yeah and I guess uh, good, good many question. many social sciences repositories they have some that are at least in Europe migrating from Nesto to Dataverse so and they, they for, for those, PyDataverse is really useful. I think there is a question for you, uh, Jim, in the chat. From uh, Genevieve. Oh, the, the, the uh, installation kind of priority list, is that what we're talking about with the Kanban boards? Um, yeah. I, I, I I don't know what, the, I, I think that's all useful to know what those are. I think um, because a lot of the, 
the bigger development is really coming when when there's specific support for it. Um, you know, the the when there are bigger items on those wish lists, it, it's not something we can you know specifically jump on the next day just because it's a it's a priority on those boards. I think those are those are useful, and I'd like to see more as we get GDCC up and running to try and use that level of information to to figure out you know where if we can do more to coordinate the developments in the community and again beyond gdcc having that kind of information about what the priorities are in the community i think will will help i think right now we're we're not taking advantage of them too much just just because there there isn't a lot of general development unless it's getting some support and then and then we've got other mechanisms to kind of to, to deal with the, the priorities. If I can There's comment on the question in the chat, sorry. Yeah. But just if I can comment quick on, on those boards, it was sort of my idea to get those going and I haven't really um, pushed them too much lately, but, and, and I wrote a little bit of code to try to aggregate them. I, I think if I spent a little time, I could, I could make like nice reports um, so we could easily gather together and see which are the top issues and then just um even without reporting if you look at any individual issue if it's been placed on a lot of boards you can just tell at a glance like wow this is on like five different boards so even without any fancy reporting i think it's a good signal to us that like this is sort of a hot issue people really want a bug fix or a, this feature There is another, another question one. in the chat. I am I I haven't heard about the non-focus, but maybe some others have. Yeah, I, I haven't. We we may need unless somebody knows. We need the that person to jump on and tell us what what that is and how they how they uh, think it might help. So maybe Sonia can. I'm looking at it. Thanks. So I guess num focus is most known for supporting Jupyter notebooks. I think there are other. I, I've um, I've given you speaking permission, Gail. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, Gail. Yeah, hey there. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. So num focus is. Uh, I mean, I'm not a. Um, I'm, I'm not a representative of it, so I don't know the details of many of this. Uh, but this, they support a lot of kind of open source um, development uh, projects that are, so Jupyter was mentioned, um, I'm more aware of the Julia side of things, um, and they have a thing also supporting some of the uh, sub-communities that develop, you know, some of the software ecosystem there. Um, I don't know if they give, I don't know if they give money directly, um, or if they provide kind of assistance towards funding, I think that's part of their role is to uh, to provide a framework for open source to kind of leverage its power in a way. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I probably worth looking at a little bit more. Um, I, I think you know, in, in terms of open source software, although we're a big community, right? We're small compared to things that that hit you know, tens of thousands of downloads and hundreds of thousands of downloads. So I don't know, um, you know, without looking further with it, whether this is, uh, whether they're looking at people our size to, to, uh, to help, but it would be useful. Sounds good. I'm not sure either. Thank you. For yeah. All. yeah. Well, thanks for the pointer. Um, what, one quick thing I wanted to throw in Philip was just again uh, thinking about the maps. We, we've looked at the sort of number of, of uh, installations and uh, um, you know the map for several years now, and, and every year we kind of come back and say, well, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not representing the community very well. And I'm I'm wondering if there's uh, you know potentially little uh, things we could do um, in the software, like for the metrics, just have a a setting you can put in your dataverse that, that lists the number of institutions or the names of institutions that are supported by that dataverse and be able to then pick up through the metric stuff counting how many 
you know, Texas, it's, it's six institutions, the, the national ones, right? How many universities are under those? And could we use that as a way to, to get a count that, that sort of reflects more how many institutions are, are pushing into these things? You know, and Harvard, again, I think there's some that the, the official repository of University X, right, or is in Harvard's dataverse, right? So it's not counting for, uh, it, it's not just Harvard University when you look at that one. All right. Thanks, everyone. We are pushing a little bit on time. Um, so if there are no other questions, I think we'll need to, let me just check the agenda one more time. Yes, uh, we should move on, if possible, to the next brief discussion and then the introduction so that we can all make the breakout sessions that start at 10. Thank you, Phil, John, Jim. Anything to add before I we move on to the next one? Only to just let us know if you need anything. And uh, this is a collaborative effort. So if you, you have people that, that would like to help, uh, paid or unpaid, let us know. Thank you, everyone. And um, now Katie um, will give us a brief presentation um, with a review and discussion forum for Force 11 and COPE Data Publishing Ethics Working Group Outputs. Sh Katie is sharing this to see if, if there's anything in this presentation um, coming out of Force 11 and COPE Data Publishing Ethics that we would want to um, make a part of um, GDCC or Dataverse installations. Um, so Katie is the data service librarian at IQSS Harvard University. Um, she joined the Harvard Library Research Data Management Program and the Harvard Dataverse Curation Team in late 2019. In her role as a data service librarian, Katie advocates for rich and computational literacy, data stewardship, and open science for students, researchers, and librarians across disciplines. Welcome, Katie. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'm adding a link to these slides in the chat, and then I'm going to close the chat so I don't get distracted. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give um, a quick update about this Force 11 working group that um, we think is pretty relevant to the Dataverse community. A number of um, our colleagues in the Dataverse community have participated in this. Um, and I just have about you know, five to seven minutes of um, kind of publicizing some of the outputs that have come out um, that we've put out recently. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so as I think we are all very well aware, um, you know, as increases in research data sharing practices um, have highlighted a growing number of ethical challenges that are related to the sharing and publication of data sets. Um, and for data sets to become recognized as important research contributions, uh, researchers need to have a rig rigorous publishing environment that provides safeguards should concerns arise. Um, researchers, on the other hand, also that are reusing the data, they need reassurance that um, the data set is also in good standing. Um, so therefore, institutions, data repositories, and journals need to have standards that create a safe space for researchers and allow them to address concerns consistently and responsibly. Um, while ethical best practices, guidelines, and recommendations for addressing ethical issues related to journal articles are well documented, uh, there are currently no established ethics standards, guidelines, or recommendations for data publications. Um, and so that was kind of the main drive to start this research data publishing ethics working group. Um, it was convened in the spring of 2021 as a collaboration between Force 11 and COPE, which is the Committee on Publication Ethics, uh, and is a little bit more relevant in the journal publishing community. Um, 
But these communities were a really good choice uh, to do this work because we knew it couldn't be accomplished um, in just the repository or just the publisher world. Um, it really needed to be a diverse group uh, and, and include all possible stakeholders that might be involved um, in a data ethics case. Uh, the goal of the group was to draft uh, non-prescriptive guidance documents that would help repositories and publishers address some ethical concerns as they come up uh, and articulate some community-built best practices for uh, managing these kinds of concerns. Um, so the working group identified four categories of concern. Um, authorship and contribution conflicts, legal and regulatory restrictions, uh, research rigor, and risk. So um, for authorship, most, if not all, data repositories um, don't ask co-authors for approval before publishing. So we really should expect that there might be some authorship and contribution conflicts that could arise post-publication. Um, this can include things like uh, disputes over authorship order, um, what happens when an author is deceased or is no longer able to be contacted um, and things like name changes that are a little bit more straightforward kind of come up um, pretty often. Um, uh, for legal and regulatory restrictions, this is kind of obviously the most complex area of recommendations um, and there's definitely still work remaining here to understand um, kind of as cases do arise, what options um, and what resources are available. Um, so in the recommendations, these are kind of broken down into licensing, policy, and regulation issues. Um, and then we should also really expect to see cases um, be dependent on the country that the data are published in, because obviously um, laws are different in different countries. Um, rigor refers to any issues regarding the validity or the trust in science. Uh, these cases are most often tied to journal articles where flaws are found in peer or post review. Um, and the underlying data are they themselves flawed. Um, rigor cases that we have discussed um, are largely caught post article publication, um, and we hope to eventually move to a state where the data are routinely analyzed and run during a manuscript peer review, which is not super common right now. Um, and then finally, risk. So when discussing risk, we initially had two categories, um, risk to participants and then risk to external communities. Um, after drafting recommendations, we realized that the workflows don't really differ enough to split these. Um, so with an overarching risk category, we have examples of both risk to humans and risk to populations. These types of cases um, are probably the most obvious um, kind of in the data world. Um, things like publishing human information or information that might, might be harmful to society. Um, and then in the recommendations, we also make, make nods to data curation being super important for fielding a lot of these things prior to publication. Um, but many repositories don't do these checks. Um, Harvard Dataverse, for example, doesn't um, do a huge amount of um, curation checks to everything that's coming in. So the, we published these recommendations in September of 2021. Um, for each of the categories of concerns, the document provides a description and examples of situations that fall into that category, context to demonstrate how the issue might be raised to the attention of the data publisher, how, things, how, how issues are identified, um, and then also recommendations on, on how the data publisher and potentially um, the publisher of a related article uh, might be able to handle the concern. Uh, the recommendations cover a broad range of scenarios, including whether or not the data set is already publicly available, whether the concern can be addressed in communication with the authors, um, and whether updates or even a removal of the data set might be required, um, along with corrections to the record for associated publications in a journal. Um, we also developed a set of policy templates that can be repurposed by publishers and data repositories. Uh, consistent and visible policies at publishers and data repositories um, is very important because it signals our commitment um, to the responsible handling of data publication. Um, it also provides clear expectations for how the data publisher is going to act in response to concerns when they do come up um, and can also be an important tool for educating researchers on what the expectations are for publishing data um, ethically. Um, so that's kind of basically it. Um, again, just kind of wanted to bring this to everyone's attention. 
Um, this slide has all the links, the citations to the recommendations, to the policy, policy templates, um, to the homepage of the working group on the Force 11 site, which doesn't have a ton of information, but might be useful to take a look at. Um, and then this PLOS biology article at the end here um, definitely gives a good overview of the work that we did um, and kind of the goals moving forward. Um, we are also kind of developing uh, flowcharts for, well, not kind of developing, we are finishing up developing flowcharts for handling of cases in different categories. Um, so that'll kind of reflect the steps that are outlined in the recommendations and, and give um, data repositories um, clear step-by-step -step actions um, when managing or dealing with ethics cases, identifying um, who the stakeholders are um, and when it's important, when it's vital to get in touch with them. Um, and those will be published on the COPE website. Um, so that's that's really all I wanted to uh, bring up for everyone. Um, happy to answer any questions that you guys might have, or um, we're definitely interested in any feedback uh, as you review these. Um, as Sonia mentioned, we at Harvard Dataverse are definitely interested in, um, if not adopting the policies that have been put out, kind of repurposing them for our needs to make it clear that we will have some kind of standard workflow for managing ethics concerns. Um, we've definitely seen them come up. We'd be interested to know kind of if, if your repositories has seen them come up. Um, but yeah, kind of kicking off um, a, a larger community conversation about this, um, we think is important and probably pretty interesting too. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Katie. Uh, any questions for Katie? Because we will move into the introduction to the Dataverse project if there are no questions. But I've also shared the open community notes document. Um, and you can you are welcome to put any comments or questions in that document and remember to use the hashtag dataverse with a capital d uh, 2022 for social media tweets today we appreciate it um, so i will get to sharing um doing an introduction to the dataverse uh, all right where's Dwayne? <laughs> i am here did we say to share and then do uh, presentation with, we said to share first. <laughs> uh, I'm having trouble getting my speaker. Start note. the presentation, then share. No, it was share and then start the presentation. All right. <laughs> All right. We're going to share. And then, and if it, this doesn't work, I will, oh, we did it wrong. I apologize. We're gonna try this one more time. Stop sharing. You said to start the presentation. All right, I'm gonna to listen to you this time. Then share the window with the presentation. Okay. Just the window with the presentation. Exactly. No, that didn't work. Oh, you have to minimize the presentation. Uh, the Zoom window shouldn't be maximized on your screen. No, that wasn't it. We just tested this. That's not, that wasn't it. Just give me one second while I troubleshoot everyone. We just did this. And if it goes away, that's okay. I would rather have my speaker notes, but that's all right. Okay, everyone. Welcome to the Dataverse Project for managing and sharing your research data. I'm Sonia and I manage curation for the Harvard Dataverse um, installation. So we are going to talk today about what the Dataverse Project is, how the Dataverse software supports research data sharing, Dataverse collection data sets and files, and Dataverse and FAIR data principles. So the Dataverse project is an open source research data repository software. It was established, uh, it establishes a research data management solution 
for your community. And as mentioned earlier, there are 80 repositories currently around the world that are based on the Dataverse software, and there are more in progress and process that have yet to be listed on the map. Uh, the software allows you to enjoy full control of your data, get your web visibility, academic credit, and increased citation counts. Um, and it allows you to establish institutional repositories or repositories to support uh, your entire community, depending on what you need. Um, journals seamlessly manage the submission, review, and publication of data associated with their published articles, uh, I think. Uh, John mentioned um, earlier and yesterday, and the Harvard Dataverse does a lot of work with journals who are uh, using a submit for review workflow to manage their deposits into Dataverse installations. Um, and some of them are also incorporating uh, reproducibility verification in that process. And of course, we have a community of developers that contribute code, uh, documentation, tense testing, and standards. Um, it integrates research and analysis, realization, and exploration tools, and other research and data archival systems within the Dataverse project. If there are questions in the queue, uh, somebody from my team who's on can answer the question. And I would appreciate someone send, uh, sharing again the open notes document so that people can take notes and ask questions. So IQSS leads the development of the open source Dataverse project software, but again, um, most of what we do cannot be done without in a, uh, the community. For Harvard, the Open Data Assistance Program at Harvard in collaboration with Harvard Library and the Office for Scholarly Communication and IQSS provides user support. The Library Technology Services at Hewitt also provides hosting and backup support of the Harvard Dataverse repository, and every installation has their own system of support um, at their institution. So there are a few things to consider about the Dataverse project. There's the community, um, the annual community meetings. This is the eighth uh, community meeting uh, that we are having now. Uh, we have bi biweekly community calls in the morning and in the evening to accommodate time zones. There is the Global Dataverse Community Consortium, the presentation that just took place in the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. Uh, the mission is to allow those communities that want to have a Dataverse um, installation to have one with the support of the community. There are best practices that we share around academic credit, data citation, uh, community norms, data management, and replication data set guidelines. And of course, the software, um, I will present um, or show a slide on the goals, roadmaps, and releases, collaborations, integration, features, source, course, and source code, and guide. And of course, all of that information is open and accessible to everyone. So we are now at 80 installations around the world. Last year, we had 72 installations at this time, and we know that there are numerous installations uh, that are pending and ready to hopefully come out this year. Each installation, by the way, um, serves their community, but there are a few installations that support um, the entire research uh, world community, the world of, of researchers. Harvard Dataverse being one, it's open to the worldwide research community for data sharing. Uh, we do have limitations, for example, at the Harvard Dataverse about how big your collection can be. We establish limitations on the per file size limit that we support. Odom Archives is another one that also provides curation services and allows self-curation of deposits. So just as an example of a few of the installations that are out there right now, we have the Harvard Dataverse installation, as mentioned, open to the worldwide research community. We allow uh, users to create collections as well as just deposit data sets into the repository. Um, there's the Fudan University uh, repository. Uh, Fudan came on board quite a while, um, a while ago as well. Um, and uh, they shared, um, they shared a video of which the video of all the installations and their updates have been shared on YouTube um, and will be shared um, in the events page for the 2022 meeting. But um, this is another installation example. And then of course, UNC Dataverse, uh, which hosts a number of um, collections as well. And again, is open to um, the outside community um, that wants to use and share data on Odom. So what's the purpose of a data repository, right? To so keep a certain population of data. And 
this, uh, the Registry of Research Data Repositories uh, is an open science tool that offers researchers, funding organizations, libraries, and publishers an overview of existing international repositories. You will find uh, the, Harvard, the Dataverse repositories uh, listed on that registry. Um, and data should always be submitted to discipline-specific community-recognized repositories where possible. Where a suitable discipline-specific resource does not exist, data should be submitted to a generalist repository. So how the Dataverse software supports research data sharing. Fair principles. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is something we're all familiar with at this point. Um, data should be findable, and we're talking about uh, DOIs or DOIs. Some of my colleagues say DOIs, so I had to say that today, but DOIs, having a persistent identifier to your data. Um, and having um, your publication that's related to your data um, also linked so that people who find your article can find your data, people who find your data can find your article. Accessible meaning that if you have data, there's licensing information for it, people know where it is, they can get to it, they can access the files or they know how to contact you to access the files. Interoperable machine readable data. So what integrations and tools and features can we provide to make the data useful um, in the environment that it's stored. And of course, reusable is you've given enough information for somebody to make use of your data, whether it's metadata, documentation, files. And we're gonna talk about how the Dataverse software can help move your data towards FAIR. It does not do FAIR on its own for you. Um, there's a, a guiding document actually that talks about um, that we, we created at um, IQSS with the help of the community on how Dataverse uh, software supports core trust seal um, certification, right? Um, it helps to move your data towards FAIR. There's some built-in capabilities of the software that will help you do that, but you still have to do the work of adding metadata and adding information and documentation and using the tools necessary to move your data towards FAIR. These are all of the features that are supported by the Dataverse software. Support for FAIR data, data citation, harvesting, um, Harvard Dataverse does quite a bit of harvesting. Uh, we harvest from other Dataverse installations, and we also harvest from other non-Dataverse non installations where we display their metadata, um, and you'll see what files are available. And when you want to access the files, if you click on it, it takes you to the owning repository in order to gain access. There are APIs, um, versioning, widgets, private URLs, uh, provenance, support for RSync, um, and I just want to mention some of the newest features, which is uh, which are embargo, custom licenses, curation status labels, just to name a few. So what does a Dataverse installation support? All Dataverse installations allow you to support Dataverse collections, but you're basically saying, this is my organization, and here's the data in my organization um, arranged in other nested collections as needed. And I'll show you examples of these. And you can continue to create nested collections within nested collections. That's a Dataverse collection. Your repository is a Dataverse installation, but the features that you use to set up a Dataverse collection are the same features that you use to create your Dataverse installation in terms of metadata, searchable facets, allowing your audience to have Dataverse collections or data sets. Now, Dataverse collections will contain data sets. Your files, your metadata, your terms, and your versions cannot exist outside of your data sets. So all Dataverse collections have to have data sets. Your installation can support data sets on their own without collections. I'm not sure I know of any installations that are not allowing their audience to create Dataverse collections if they need to um, in order to uh, use controlled workflows if possible, because that's really available here. Um, adding additional metadata is available at this level if you're not using the default metadata and facets that the repository has. So Dataverse Collections allows your audience um, to have more control and flexibility around the information that they provide to their um, audience, to their users. Uh, and again, your data sets will contain your files, it'll contain metadata, it'll contain terms, uh, and it'll contain versioning. The Dataverse Collection, the data set, and the file all have permissions available for them at every level. So I can have somebody in my Dataverse collection who is an administrator. I can have three people that are contributors. They cannot publish. They can only 
add data sets, I can add curators. The curators can deposit a data set and publish a data set for me. Administrators can do everything, including deleting content. Okay, but at every level, you're going to find permissions, workflows, and roles defined for you. So for repo this is something you'll see for repositories and for Dataverse collections, okay? When you set up a repository, you decide what, what your audience can do in your repository. For Harvard Dataverse, the setting is that anyone can add Dataverses, subdataverses, and data sets. So they can come in. If they add a data set, they are using the Harvard Dataverse default um, metadata and searchable facets. If they create a collection of their own, or what we call subdataverses, um, then they can manage additional metadata that they want to use. They can add additional searchable facets to their collection. And I will show you some um, slides, screenshots of existing collections that do that. We can always also control the contributor and curator role. If you have your audience set as a contributor in your repository, they cannot publish their data set. They can deposit data sets, but um, either collection managers or repository managers have to do the publication of that content. Most of our journals that have a reproducibility workflow tied to their uh, collections are using the contributor role because they want authors to submit their data sets. And then some of those data sets go through the uh, reproducibility verification process. A number of them use Odom services to do the reproducibility verification. Um, there's at least one journal that's using Code Ocean to do the reproducibility verification. And once that um, reproducibility is verified, then the person who owns the collection will go in and publish the data set. If the reproducibility can't be verified, that content is sent back to the author to fix whatever issues were found with the reproducibility. Curators in a repository or in a collection can add content and they can publish content. So when I have a repository or I have a Dataverse collection within a repository, there are some roles that I can add. The administrator can do anything in a repository, uh, mostly in a repository or in a collection. Then I have the contributor, again, who cannot publish. I have a curator who can add data sets and publish. I can also give the role of file downloader. Um, file downloader really comes into play when I want to make um, content accessible. If I give somebody permission at the, as a file downloader on a data set, that means that going forward, they can download every version of a data set that I put into a collection, right? I can also only grant access by file um, and that restricts the person to only certain files. So if I have a collection and I have different licenses for my data um, or somebody's requesting, you know, I have 10 restricted files they're, re they're requesting to, I can just give them access to the two files. I don't need to give them access to every single file. This also prevents a user from having access to content um, when I version later in the future. Dataverse collections, data sets, and files. So we've talked about Dataverse installations and we mentioned Dataverse collections earlier. Well, what you can do for a Dataverse collection, um, th these are all the same features that you have when you create your repository. General information allows you to put in your metadata, your facets, a uh, description of your collection, your repository, um, the metadata that you're supporting, the facets that you want to be searchable on your page. Themes and widgets is all the customization. You're gonna see some examples of all of the customization. I've shown you the Harvard, Fudan, and Odom, and you've seen the customization, the logos. Um, you can take a widget of any collection that you create, even a data set that you create, and you can embed that widget in your personal website. We have lots of scholars that do that using Open Scholar at Harvard, uh, but it doesn't have to be an Open Scholar software that you're using. You can embed the widget into your staff page. You can embed the widget into your organization page. You can embed the widget into your journal page. And we have um, collections that do that. Permissions, as I mentioned, is available at the collection level, at the data set level, and at the file level. Groups is another form of permission. The data set templates allow you to customize consistent data deposits. If pre, which is International Food and Research Policy Institute, um, uses templates to guide all of their multiple curators. They have a large group of curators, but they uh, pre-fill a template with uh, instructions on how to deposit the data, how to add metadata, exactly how they wanna see the met metadata added. Um, and that will help large organizations with lots of deposits to keep their um, curation or their metadata information consistent. 
There's a data set guest book that you enable at the Dataverse collection level or at the repository level, and you can collect information on who's using a particular data set, why they're using it, what they're doing with it. Are they using Data Explorer? Are they downloading the file? Are they doing previews of the file only? But you get a ni nice information in the back end about how your users are managing the, are, are using the data. Feature Dataverses highlight your nested Dataverse collections, and I will show you some examples of those. So here are the metadata. This is basically what you see when you have a Dataverse repository. It's also what you see when you create a collection. You are naming your repository. If you're creating a collection, you're creating a collection within a repository. You get an identifier that you put in. Be very careful with your identifier. It provides you the URL that you use when you share your research space with the outside world. Um, if you change that identifier, <laughs> the old link will not resolve. You would have to share the new link. You get a category, are your organization, an institution, a laboratory, a teaching course, a journal, um, your email for contacts, your affiliation. Storage will be shown um, when you create your collection. Are you using S3 by default? Now, this is set by the repository. So, for example, the Harvard Dataverse uh, provides more storage space. We have a different S3 bucket for Center for Astrophysics because they tend to have larger data sets. So we give them more storage space, the ability to upload larger files that we don't give to everybody that comes to Harvard Dataverse. So repositories have the ability to set that. And of course you wanna give a description of your collection. Every collection or repository gets to select the metadata fields that they want to display. If you come into Harvard Dataverse and you add a data set, all you're going to get is the citation metadata block because that's all the repository makes required. And for FACETS, we, we, we use subject, author name and author affiliation. If you create your own collection within the Harvard Dataverse repository, you can select multiple metadata blocks to display, and you can select all of the additional facets that you would like to be searchable within your collection that is within the Harvard Dataverse. That is how the, that's what the software allows you to do. Each individual repository is going to determine what they allow their audience to do when they come and use that repository. So here are some examples. The IF International Food Policy Research Institute has links, uh, descriptions and links on the Harvard Dataverse uh, repository website that goes to their policies, their data management policies, their terms of use. They also have all these nested collections. They set permissions between these nested collections and their parent collection. So who can manage what is determined by that permission level? As I said, permissions are not inherited. So the group that I have managing CGIAR could be a different group that's managing Africa Rising, that's managing ASTI, okay? Um, and these are the searchable facets that they use. Now I mentioned that Harvard Dataverse only uses three. I think we do subject, author name, author affiliation because we allow everybody to come in and create their own collections. But as you can see, FP uses a whole other set of searchable facets. So that if I wanna narrow my, down, my search from 602 data sets, to just the ones dealing with nutrition, I can get 98 data sets by just clicking on the keyword facet uh, for nutrition. This one, um, this collection is at Odom, a UNC Dataverse, and CDOCS Dataverse. They have their collections. And this is what they use for their, some of what they use for their searchable facets. Okay, now if I click on Dataverses, I get to see these seven Dataverse collections listed, these nested collections. If I select data sets as a facet, I get 25 data sets to look at. If I were to click on the files facet, I'm going to get information related to files. What I'm going to get is the file type, file tags if any are used, and I'm also going to see files that are restricted and files that are public. So again, here's the permission workflows and roles that come with having a collection. You set this in your collection and it's the same thing you see when you create your repository and you're setting permissions for your repository. Now, those are collections. So data sets, as I said, exist within a collection or they can exist at the root of any repository depending on the permissions the repository sets. So you have files, metadata, terms, and versions. Those are the tabs that make up your data set. Metadata is what you're going to see initially when you come in, because you're going to see your citation. You're going to see your description. You're going to see the button for contact. You're going to see keywords. You're going to see any additional metadata blocks and for information that was added. So in, if we look at Africa Rising Dataverse, which exists in the IFPRI Dataverse that I was just talking about, 
the first thing you're going to see is the citation at the very top. Um, and with this citation, what you're getting is the standard citation um, that the Dataverse software allows. You get the name of the institution, the year of publication, the title, the DOI, the repository, the version. UNFs are being um, phased out, so I'm not going to talk about that now. But the first thing you see in the data set is the citation at the top of the page, the ability to contact the owner, the metrics, the ability to share it. Now, data citations, um, there's a field in, when, you're, when you're depositing data sets into a Dataverse installation, any Dataverse repository, um, that allows you to connect your publication uh, to your data. For, for example, for most journal workflows, when a journal um, author submits a data set, um, they are going to get a DOI for their data set. Um, if the journal is managing the publication of data and connection to articles, they're going to put that DOI from the data set into the article when it's accepted. Um, so the article will come back to the data set and the data set has a space in related publication for you to connect your article to your data by directional linking. Um, but the formal data citation um, gives you the ability to connect your publication to your data. Uh, examples of data citations are based on the joint, joint declaration of data citation principles, uh, where you get credit and attribution to the author, unique identifier, uh, identification access, uh, persistent access, um, and specific version of the data that are used. And I'll talk about versioning and how it use, works in a Dataverse repository in a minute. So data citation in a repository has seven components. You have the author names that we mentioned. You are allowed to put in all the author names. It gives you a little plus sign so that everybody gets credit for their data. Um, there was actually one example that I showed in the Harvard Dataverse repository slide earlier, and there were so many um, authors on that um, on that list. The year of uh, the data that the data was published in the Dataverse repository, um, there is a, a, um, a kind of tweak you can do. For example, uh, the Murray Archive is an old archive. The data were acquired years ago. Um, and we brought it into the Harvard Dataverse repository um, after 2004. So we are able to tweak the date of pub that it was published in the Dataverse repository because that data, those data sets were actually published much earlier and those are the dates we want to use. IFPRI also does this. Their data were released a long time ago, uh, but when they brought it into the Dataverse repository, they didn't want to use the current date because that's not when the data were actually made available to the public. So there is some tweaking that people can do to, um, or researchers can do if they need to. There's a global persistent identifier. The Dataverse supports both DOIs and handles. Um, you get the repository that published the data set. You get the version number. And as I said, there's a link to UNF here, but for tabular data and which I'll, I'll talk about, but that's being phased out. So I'm not gonna discuss it here, but here's your, your typical um, citation will look like um, for a data set deposited data. Um, when you have deposited a data set in a Dataverse repository, if you are the owner of that data set, you get to upload more files, metadata, set the terms. There's permission at the data set level, there's permission at the file level. Private URLs allow you to share your data set when it's in draft format. So if you have um, uh, your, your peers, your, your additional authors that need to review content before it's published, you can use the private URL feature as long as your data set is not published. Uh, it creates a link that you can enable and disable once the data set has been looked at by your collaborators. There's always still thumbnails and widgets um, at the data set um, and file level, and there's the ability to deaccession a data set once a data set is published. Data sets can only be deleted if they are in draft format. Um, in draft format, your DOI is only reserved for you. It's not registered with data site. So if you need to delete content, you can. After a data set has been published, the ability you only have the option to deaccession a data set. Deaccessioning is not a tool for correcting errors. It is a tool for, it's, it's actually a tool based on workflow, right? Um, legally, I'm supposed to remove this data set after a certain time or in very, very you know, important uh, cases where you have uploaded identifying information by mistake, I still wouldn't use, uh, there's a process for using deaccession um, in order to um, remove the identified cont an identifiable data set while still maintaining your DOI and creating a clean version of that data set. So just remember that if you're using a Dataverse repository, 
you don't have to delete a published data set because it has the identifiable data. There is a workflow that allows you to maintain your DOI um, and revive your data set if you have deaccessioned it um, so that you don't have to start the whole process again. Again, data sets have the same permissions, workflows, and roles available to you at the data set level and at the file level for permissions and access. So when you create a data set, we've already, I've already showed you the citation that would show up first, then you get the description and all the additional uh, metadata that you have added to a data set. Your initial view gives you a limited view of the metadata, but you see the tabs for files, metadata, terms, and versioning. In this case, they also have a, a link that goes to their data use agreement. Um, and they use a lot of keywords and their file is restricted for access. You only get access to this file if you request access. And in this case, they're giving you data use agreement forms. But if you go under terms for this data set, you're also gonna see the information on how to request access or if this file is embargoed. So files, metadata, terms, and versions, Files that are restricted for access, even though you see these options here that look like you can access them, you really can't. If you were to click on this little drop down menu, what it's going to say is this file is restricted and you need to look at terms or re uh, request access to the data. You can filter by file type, by access, and by file tags if they were used. When a file is not restricted, and I, will, I have a link to tabular ingest and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, when a file is not restricted, here's what you're able to do. You're able to preview files where it's possible. When you hit that little drop down download, you are going to get information about the file that you're trying to access. In this case, I was looking at the impact of migration.tab, which is a tabular file. Tabular file, because it went through with this additional archival preservation process in ingest process in the Dataverse repository. Originally, it's a state of 14 binary. If somebody doesn't have Stata, they can download it as a tab delimited file, our data file. They can get variable metadata. They can get data file citation information. They can view the data. They can do data explorer. Um, and viewing the data and data explorer integrated tools that you would have to put into your repository um, in order to use it with your files. Um, trying to see if there was something else that was shown here. I want you to also notice that tabular files pull up the number of variables and the number of observations, and they give you that UNF that's being discontinued. Um, we do offer, so I don't forget to mention it, um, file level U, uh, DOIs are available and installations decide how they will provide that to the audience, to their users. Okay, Harvard Dataverse is having a conversation about how we'd like to provide this because not every user wants it, not every user needs it. So, and there's a cost to providing these DOIs, especially when you're a generalist repository open to the worldwide research community. So here are the supported for file formats for that tabular ingest that I mentioned that allows you to do to download the file in various formats, not just the original format. It also allows you to do data analysis and exploration of those files using Data Explorer. I don't know if anybody's still using Two Ravens because Two Ravens was another data analysis and visualization uh, tool that's available to integrate. Um, but SPSS, Data, R, Excel, CSV um, files are all files that can be ingested with a subdibular additional tabular functionality um, that allows um, the previews and allows the download in multiple formats. Sometimes the files, if they have additional formatting in them, they will fail this additional ingest. The file is still uploaded. The additional ingest is version supported. So I want you to see that SPSS is up to 22. Stata is only up to 15 and we are always about a year of version behind. So um, everything that fails tabular ingest doesn't necessarily have to succeed, but you get more functionality if you get this additional ingest. If not, your file in original format is fine. SAS users, for example, do not want us to ingest the file and change it to a different format. The computing has to happen in a SAS environment, so they prefer their files to remain in SAS. Here's what the data exploration tool, Data Explorer, uh, created by Scholars Portal, which is now Borealis, um, looks like. Uh, so if I have a tabular file, then I can do run the Data Explorer tool, and I can do some visualization um, and analysis of a tabular file. Here is a preview tool. 
one of the previewers, the Dataverse previewers, and there's links to everything um, in the slides that you will, will be uploaded to the event page. But here is a preview of a file. The other uh, recent previewer uh, that is available and we are now have in the Harvard Dataverse, I don't know how many other installations are using the GeoJSON previewer, it's per installation, um, they determine their own integrations. But here is a visual of the GeoJSON previewer for geospatial data. And I added, uh, this is for, this is a um, screenshot from our demo website that's available for testing. Um, but this is what the geo um, JSON previewer looks like. The embargo feature is also a feature I wanted to highlight this year um, because we just added it. Um, it was released this year and we just added it to the Harvard Dataverse and the IFPRI collection is already using it. So I want you to see that under file options is at the file level that you get to embargo files. It shows up next to the file that's embargoed as embargoed. If you look, go to the file landing page, you get to see how long the file is embargoed for. It also shows up on the data set um, title as embargoed so that everyone can see that the file is not available at this time. When that embargo date expires, um, that data set, the data set files will automatically be available. Um, and it'll also be available if the depositor wants to restrict and not use embargo after the embargo has expired. So if they decide that it's embargoed, but then when it's time to release it, they decide that they're going to restrict it so that they can get um, you to maybe sign an additional agreement. Researchers can do that with the embargo feature, with, with um, the um, access restriction features on um, Dataverse. Each installation gets to set the length of the embargo. So in the Harvard Dataverse, you're allowed to set it for as long as you need. Some other installations might only allow you to do it for a year or six months. Each installation gets to decide that process. This is all of the metadata. So we've talked about files. Um, this is all of the, the metadata that the Dataverse software supports. Citation metadata, DDD, DDI Lite, Codebook, Datacite 3.1, Dublin Core. Um, the standards that come with the software, geospatial, social science, astronomy, life science, journal, citation. Custom metadata block creation is available in a Harvard data, in a Dataverse installation. Harvard Dataverse provides custom metadata blocks for researchers that we sit with and speak with and consult with, depending on their needs to share additional metadata that is not maybe part of a standard, but they want to display and make searchable, excuse me and make searchable. Each Dataverse installation, again, gets to decide if that is something they want to support. So if you were to go to our demo.dataverse.org website, which is the demo website that is available for everybody around the world to use to test the features, you will see some additional metadata blocks available when you create a Dataverse collection that we've created for people using the Harvard Dataverse repository. We would rather always have metadata placed on standards, but when standards are not available, I think it's also more important that we allow repositories uh, or researchers to be able to add additional metadata that they think is important for their collection. So here is what the standards that come with the Dataverse software are. Here's what some of it looks like when you put it into, um, a data set, but look at the export meta, the exported metadata that you get. You get to export the metadata in Dublin Core, DDI, data site, um, DDI codebook, JSON, et cetera. Custom metadata blocks are only exportable in JSON. They are not exportable in these other formats. So that's one drawback of having a custom metadata, but you still get to um, add more information, make it searchable in your own collection, and it's still download um, exportable in JSON. So the terms page for accessibility, right? Every time you add a data set, it's important that you have a license. So the update in the past year has been that custom license uh, licensing has been developed. So um, and so you can choose the license. Um, again, you have to put that into your installation. You can choose the license that you want to display for your data set. Custom terms still exist. So some collections have application forms, some just have a long terms of use statement 
whatever it is for terms of use and terms of access, right? There's terms of use, there's terms of access. Um, you can set your custom terms or you can select um, the terms that are listed in the multiple licensing option. The custom terms now show up not just on the terms page, but on the front page of your data set, you'll also be able to see the license that that data set is supported by. And versioning is available. So if you do metadata changes, um, it's usually a minor version, but the system will allow you to push it to a major version change, depending on you know, if you think that you made enough metadata changes to warrant a whole new version. Anytime you remove, update, change, replace, delete, a file of any type, you are going to be pushed to a major version change. As repository administrators, you have the ability to overwrite versions. That is a decision that you make within your own installation. Um, if um, a version needs to be over, if you need to overwrite a version in a data set instead of doing a minor or a major version change and keeping the same version on number. As we mentioned about deaccessioning, there is a process for using deaccessioning. Um, it's 10 o'clock, by the way, for those who need to run into any other session, but this is just about over. Um, for um, deaccessioning, there are rules around deaccessioning. Do not use it to fix mistakes. There's a process and you can always reach out to an installation manager um, to explain to you the process. This person did a good job by saying this data set has been transferred to another repository. A better job would have been had they put in the DOI that goes to the other repository. So as we mentioned, Dataverse software itself alone by itself will not move you, will not completely do fair ever, but using the tools and the features and the metadata and the file formats and the terms um, and the versioning will move you towards fair. And the roadmap is always available on dataverse.org to discuss, um, to list out the, what the, the goals of the project are at a high level. And if you'd like hands-on basics, please navigate to dataverse, demo.dataverse.org. Don't put any real data in there that you don't want people to use. And that, and so that um, website does get cleaned out at least once a month or every 30 days from the date of creation of a data set, that content gets removed. Thank you. And I think there are some questions, but I think people might have um, already answered it. There are two questions in here. Do you have any plans to harvest data set metadata from Zenodo, DSpace, and other repositories? Um, I don't, um, if, if, if you're asking particularly for Harvard data versus Slava, I don't know, but I think you're also in a session. I don't think you're in here now. Um, it's, I don't, uh, it's not a, a discussion that has come up recently. I'm sure we've talked about it and it will be something that we revisit in the future. And then Maribel asks, is there any instance person that offers advisory services in the implementation optimization of Dataverse? Yes, absolutely. So Odom Archives, by the way, uh, helps with um, um, installation services. Harvard Dataverse does advisory on curation services. And then the GDCC would also be the place to reach out to for advisory services and the implementation and optimization of Dataverse. And they can connect you to services. So I hope that was helpful. And I'm also uh, going to, if there are no further questions, I am going to close out um, and go to other talks today. Um, so you are welcome. Um, the document was shared for the open notes and we will hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.